So I'm going to go ahead and introduce us today. Um, welcome everyone to today's panel um, titled The Role of Social Media in Archaeological Education and Outreach, a Roundtable Discussion, hosted by the Collaborative, Collaborative Archaeology Workgroup and the UMA Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Irina Bachi, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Michigan Museum of Anthropological Archaeology, and I'll be facilitating today's panel. The Collaborative, Collaborative Archaeology Workgroup is a Rackham interdisciplinary workshop that fosters collaboration among archaeologists that work in different disciplines on UM's campus. This year, cause programming has focused on exploring the role that archaeology plays in the contemporary world, including the impact of its colonial and imperial legacies, which extend into the academic institutions we are a part of. I want to begin today's lecture uh, by acknowledging the early and ongoing entanglements of the history of this university with indigenous and black communities. The University of Michigan is founded on land that was dispossessed from indigenous peoples and funded by money from slavery. I would like to recognize the 1817 Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids with the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Badawatami nations and reaffirm their ancestral and contemporary ties to this land and the contributions of both black and indigenous peoples to this university. The topic of today's discussion is the role of social media in archaeology. Social media has fundamentally reshaped the way our society produces, consumes, and circulates information. In social media, teachers and researchers have found efficient platforms for sharing their expertise with an ever-widening and diverse audience. Yet, the impact of social media on specific academic disciplines such as archaeology remains partially examined. This roundtable features five archaeologists who actively use social media platforms to educate public audiences about archaeology. The panelists will discuss their particular approaches to using social media for archaeological education and their views on best practices for social media-based outreach. Our panel today will proceed in three parts. Introductions, uh, directed questions for specific panelists, and then an open Q&A from the audience. I will briefly introduce the panelists before we begin and then allow them to introduce themselves more in depth before moving towards the Q&A portion of our panel today. During this time, please feel free to use the Q&A function to submit questions that you would like our panelists to answer later on. Um, just two quick notes on tech. The live uh, we have live transcripts available for you in English if you would like them. And also the chat function has been disabled for today's panel. Uh, so I'm going to move on and introduce everybody very briefly. Thank you for bearing with me through that intro. Uh, so joining us today, we have Natasha Wilson, a senior CRM archaeologist and television presenter based in London, England. Um, you may know Natasha as the creator um, of Tosh Archaeo and Behind the Trowel, two popular Instagram and YouTube accounts dedicated to archaeological education and outreach. She is also the co-host of the new TV show, The Great British Dig, History in Your Back Garden. Welcome, Natasha. Next, allow me to introduce Connor Johnnan. Connor is an archaeologist and GIS specialist who works in culture resource management. He is also a co-host of the podcast, A Life in Ruins, produced by the Archaeology Podcast Network. A Life in Ruins is his method of inspiring the next generation of archaeologists while also communicating complex archaeological topics to the wider audience. Uh, welcome, Connor. Our next panelist is Raven Todd De Silva. Raven is an art conservative and content creator. She is the founder of Dig It With Raven, a popular YouTube and Instagram account, where she creates a series of educational video videos dedicated to educating the general public about archaeology. She has discussed everything from overviews of dating techniques to making 4,000-year-old recipes. Thank you for joining us today, Raven. Next, we have Carlton Gover. Colton is a PhD student in anthropology at the University of Colorado Boulder. He is also a tribal citizen of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma and sits on the board of directors for the Museum of the Pawnee Nation. His research utilizes indigenous knowledge and history in interpreting and analyzing the archeological record. Welcome, Carlton. And last but not least, we have David Ian Howe. David serves as a laboratory manager for New South Associates and the Veterans Curations Program. David's academic research focuses on lithic technology, dog domestication, and hunter-gatherer ecology. David's current interests include social media outreach, production, and science communication. Thank you for being here, David. Welcome again, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today and for giving us some of your time to talk to us about social media. I'm going to ask that you take a few minutes to tell the audience a little bit more about yourselves. Natasha, do you mind going first? Hello everyone, thank you for having me here today. It's been an absolute pleasure, first of all, to be 
on this platform with you and to be with my Instagram archaeology buddies like it's, it's an absolute pleasure to to be a part of the community so my name is Natasha Bilson I am a commercial field archaeologist that basically means that I'm a more of a professional professional archaeologist what we say in the UK that means that we work in the industry so I've been doing that now for eight years um, in that time I've supervised uh, really large infrastructure sites as well as some famous iconic places such as Westminster Abbey I've been was there for I think six months last year um, so it's um it's really my experience probably to the table is working from a UK based commercial unit, um, my life as an archaeologist, and that's what Tash underscore Archeo is, that's sort of an account of everyday life. Then you have behind the trial, which is more of a platform to show other areas of archaeology and connecting with archaeologists across the world. Um, I have a YouTube channel called Behind the Trial as well, uh, a live stream archaeologist and quarantine show which connects archaeologists like the ones that you will be meeting today. Uh, we've all been able to speak on that. So for me, um, I love my work. I, I, I love it. It's more of a hobby to me. And it's very important to have public engagement as without that, I don't think we have a future in the industry. So that's why I'm so, I have so much passion for the social aspect of archeology span and I look forward to the panel. Wonderful, thank you so much, Natasha. Um, Connor, would you mind telling us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, no problem. Um... I want to start off by uh, thanking Arena uh, for facilitating this conversation and the University of Michigan for hosting these brown bag talks. Um, my name is Connor John and I am a GIS specialist that works for Alpine Archaeological Consultants Incorporated, located in the lovely Montrose, Colorado. I got my undergraduate degree at Colorado State University and my master's degree at the University of Wyoming. Uh, I am also a co-host of a Life in Ruins podcast, along with Carlton and David, who are here with us today. Our podcast is hosted and edited by the team over at the Archaeology Podcast Network. Um, our podcast focuses on the diverse experiences of archaeologists and their inspiration for getting into the field of archaeology. Uh, we try to make our conversations fun, yet serious, and I can guarantee you that there will be a joke at the end of each episode that is punny and might make you groan significantly. Um, I, I feel like I am the representative from the, the US um, uh, for the cultural resources management where Natasha is kind of the UK representative of that. So I, I hope to bring some uh, thought and insight um, both on podcasting and uh, cultural resources management to this discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Connor. Um, Raven, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Irina, for organizing this and the University of Michigan for hosting us to chat about pretty much what we do for fun on the weekends. Um, so my name is Raven Todd De Silva. I'm originally from Canada. I'm now based in the UK. Uh, Irina and I actually have the same alum for our undergrad, U University of Toronto. So we probably had class together. We just didn't know it. And so that's where I kind of focused on Roman Egyptian archaeology. I am, as she said, an, a, an art conservator that got my first master's in the University of Amsterdam for art conservation, particularly in archaeological materials. And I am currently a master's candidate at University College London, focusing on the archaeology and heritage of Egypt and the Middle East, where my research is currently now focusing towards the secondary mortuary rituals towards Neolithic Near East in the uh, in Southwest Asia. So Jordan, Israel, all of that area. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. I've done work uh, archeological wise uh, for conservation projects in North Macedonia, Italy and Greece. And I've excavated in both Greece and Oman recently. But my main focus as for this is mostly public outreach. And I have a YouTube channel called Dig It With Raven and I have all the other socials that kind of go along with it. And it kind of was birthed out of the need for me to make all the videos that I wanted to have during my undergraduate and bring all of that education online to the public. And that's kind of now progressed further into more PR and social media outreach for other archeological sites as well. So for example, I'm working with the Amsterdam Troy project to kind of bring the public into that project and give it more awareness. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Raven. And I think it's so funny that we we're probably in the same class as <laughs> the world is. The archaeology world is a small one. Um, Carlton, uh, would you like to tell the audience a little bit more about yourself? And I do know you want to share your screen. So Absolutely. You Just a, yeah, I feel. Let's see here. There we go. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Carlton Shield Chief Gover. God, dude, I, this is what happens when you have two monitors. It does this every time. Um, my name is Carlton Shield Chief Gover. I go by he, him, his pronouns. I'm a, at the University of Colorado Boulder. I'm a PhD student in anthropology, very close to candidacy. And I'm also pursuing a graduate certificates in museum studies and indigenous studies, as well as the uh, president for anthropology graduate student association representing 50 anthropology students here at the University of Colorado Boulder. I am a tribal citizen of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. I sit on the museum board of directors as well as the cultural center planning committee and I'm the archeology span consultant to the cultural resources division. So we're TIPO and NAGPRA coordinator. Uh, podcasting, kind of social media. Social media has really become more of David and Connor's realm. I've kind of stepped back from it. Um, still involved uh, a little. And I'm a host of A Life in Ruins. Um, which Connor's touched upon, as well as Museum Unlocked, which is a podcast aimed at exposing the eclectic careers of museum staff and personnel in many different subfields and how they got into museums, and then Site Bites, which is another archaeology podcast. And on top of all that, I'm the chair of the Anthropological Society uh, Student Affairs Committee, as well as a research associate for a Ukrainian-based archaeological um, research group and on the board of directors for the History Underground, which is a 501c3 nonprofit aimed at providing uh, resources for um, indigenous, black, and uh, Latino students, and as well as um, students from low economic uh, basis to pursue careers in archaeology and, and have the financial means to support themselves during graduate school. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carlton. Um, and as I switch screens, David, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. Um, my name is David. I uh, went to University of Tennessee, Knoxville for my undergrad. And then I uh, really liked hunter-gatherer studies. So I went to Wyoming to learn from Bob, uh, or excuse me, Dr. Kelly. And um, that was really fun. And I studied uh, like projectile point and hunter-gatherer like politics and got to do some cool experiments with that. What I really wanted to do was like media outreach or like filming and production. And like, it's hard to just get an anthropology degree that also teaches you film school at the same time. So when I left school, I kind of just had to teach myself that. And it's been, <laughs> it's been an experience. Um, but with that, I've been using Instagram to do social media outreach, um, did the podcast with these guys. Uh, I have a YouTube channel I'm trying to grow now. Um, but my main thing is, uh, I like dogs, if you didn't know that about me. Um, and I use dogs to like teach people anthropology. So you lure them in with the cute puppy pictures, but then you throw some HBE at them at the same time. And they seem to like it. So it, it's working. Um, and then my main job, I'm a laboratory manager for the Veterans Creation Program uh, in Georgia. And we hire veterans to curate uh, archeological collections owned by the Army Corps of Engineers. So it's a fun job. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. And thank you all um, for those wonderful introductions. Um, we're going to move it now into the direct que directed questions portion of the Q&A. Uh, and my first question is for Raven. So Raven, you have created a series of videos that are specifically curated towards education. And I'm, th I'm thinking, for example, your Agents of Deterioration um, series. Um, how did you decide that video clips, specifically on a free and accessible platform like YouTube, um, were the way to go as opposed to a more traditional uh, written medium of our discipline? Great question. So for me, the biggest thing with written information is that it can get really long and drawn out and you can really feel bogged down with the information and it's really difficult sometimes to pick out what's important and what you need to take away from, from it. And it's, it's good to have someone who can sort of just wade through all of that information, take out the important bits and curate it in a way, filter everything out, pick what's important and just get rid of the, the faff and all the mumbo jumbo that you don't need. And I find it, you know, it's much nicer personally, everyone has different learning preferences and systems, but to watch a, a 10 minute quick video summarizing a subject versus 
trying to wade through 30 pages of information. So that way you can kind of pick out what's important, figure out what you want to focus on or what interests you most, then you can further delve into that. So that's my main thing is kind of just get the Coles notes of it, especially if you're studying or if you have a midterm or an exam coming up. I, I know when I was, you know, studying for midterms and doing main like my bachelor's stuff, all I wanted was a 10 minute video just to explain something to me. So I knew the stuff. Um, so that's the main reason why I do them online. And I also want to make them just freely accessible because so much of our research, especially in archaeology, we get trapped in our little ivory tower of academia. And there seems to be so much gatekeeping that goes on within archaeology and the research, and especially in the field of conservation. I found that was the hardest one to kind of break into. And that's that really deters people away who might be interested in the subject from pursuing it, whether it be through just lack of information available, lack of access, or just their, you know, they don't have the privilege of gaining uh, access to that. And having it on this widely accessible platform for everyone has a really good potential to reach a wider audience. You know, there's a greater chance for collaboration and further research and new ideas, and it just really opens up the conversation and, and it can also grab the next generation. So that's sort of why I started most of these, all, all of them, I would say, all of these educational video series that I do, because it's just easier and it's a little bit nicer for everyone to just get introduced to the subject without getting overwhelmed. Awesome. Thank you so much, Raven. I was one of those students that studied for tests with YouTube videos, so I appreciate you. And I know that many colleagues actually refer their students to your videos as well, so thank you. I want to open up the floor. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, that's, that's really sweet. Thanks. I'm glad uh, they're being used by someone. Yeah, for, for archaeology education purposes, it's, it's so wonderful that we have that resource. Um, and I wanted to open up the floor to anyone else on the panel that maybe wanted to comment on the question or add to it. And, or if not, we can move on to the next question. Uh, I wanted to at least uh, mention it. I know um, Carlton has talked about this on our podcast previously. Um, these these videos are, um, especially in the time that we're currently living in, they are this amazing resource um, for folks who might not get as much interaction or face-to-face -face conversations or um, you know, all these other things that you're missing because of this pandemic. So I think what Raven is doing and and is, is especially prevalent and, and useful now to help um, folks in the field. And I think that's that's absolutely fantastic. So, you know, thanks Raven for what you do. Thanks, Connor. <laughs> Very sweet. Yes, they do. Thank you for that, Connor. Yeah, they do provide that kind of interface for a sort of more personal interaction, which is really nice, especially now. Um, our next question is for, for you, actually. So this is perfect. Good transition. Um, so podcasts are a common platform used by academics for educational purposes. And um, our question is, why do you think that is? Um, is it simply easier for us to transition to podcasts than other types of social media platforms, for example? Yeah, I think... Um, podcasts uh, are the are a very common platform used by academics for this outreach because we are we're ultimately given the tools to be successful in podcasts throughout our academic careers. So college involves research papers and presentations about what you find during your research, um, with interaction um, with the teachers and students afterwards. Um, and you know, students are constantly interacting with professors and ask questions about topics that are that are being lectured upon. Um, and as you as you kind of keep going in your in your college career, as you go into later undergraduate degree kind of classes and graduate de degree classes, you either become the lecturer, the person who's giving these these talks and and providing information, or you are more heavily involved in. Uh, these discussion based classes where it's not someone sitting up at the front talking to you the whole time where it's you have to be present you have to be involved and you have to answer questions and 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 understand kind of what you're studying um, so and then you know eventually if this if academia is the route that you choose you become the professor and your full time job is literally explaining 
and clarifying things along with many other responsibilities, including but not limited to grading papers, publishing research, applying for grants, et cetera. It's a, it's a laundry list. So I feel like our whole academic career, we are taught to do research, present the findings of our research, and also field questions slash clarify to students and professors. It is, it's, it's always this conversation between various parties, uh, this back and forth that involves questions, answers, rabbit holes, and sometimes more questions um, than answers. So I feel like the, a podcast is just a more intimate manifestation of this process that we go through from day one in our academic careers. Um, it is familiar, it is comfortable, and many folks could do it without notes or reminders about what to, to what to mention. So I've noticed, and um, my co-hosts can either deny or um, agree with me on this, uh, that once we get past this kind of in initial introduction of how they got into archaeology, um, which can be awkward for folks, it's not something we normally talk about um, in the academic sphere, um, our guests really like flourish ultimately and thrive as soon as they get to talking about their research. Uh, this change is, is super evident as they move through what they have talked about frequently through their careers. So I think to sum it up, ac academia really gives us the tools to be successful in podcasting, or at least it makes that transition to it very simple. Um, that being said, our first episodes of our podcast are extremely rough, and I'm not sure academia did the best job of teaching us how to host a podcast, although we eventually figured it out. Um, so I, I just think it's it's just a, it's much easier for academics to use podcasts than other forms of social media. But um, as we're currently in a pandemic, I, you know, the future might be different. Um, I know that there's these these teachers and professors who are um, forced to be kind of more creative right now, um, and even in some cases are encouraged to explore presenting their info in different formats. Um, I know. Dr. Lewis Bork, who is uh, with the Black Trial Collective and uh, also a professor, had his students give, you know, the final assignment was to create a meme about something in archaeology. And those memes were hilarious. And they're, 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 they're kind of these cool ways to portray information. Um, and you can do, you can talk about archaeology through videos like Raven and Natasha and uh, David do. Um, also, David does TikTok, so make sure and go follow him on there. Um, and you can use, uh, there's like a, a variety of these things um, to convey information about the past. And I'm really excited to see where that goes. Um, but like David mentioned, he, you aren't given um, film school skill sets while you're trying to be an academic um, or in an archeological career. So these are, these are definitely not parts that are a part of the curricula or um, involved in anthropology and archeology departments. Um, so I think, you know, obviously people are very successful at this and have been using archaea or have been using different forms of social media to talk about archaeology and anthropology and the past in general. Um, it's not always straightforward like that, but I'm I'm very lucky to be on a panel right now with folks who are actually doing that and are, are successful at doing that. So uh, definitely follow these guys if you're interested in archaeology, anthropology, the past, anything that has to do with it. Can I jump in on that too, if you don't mind? Of course. Of course. Thank um, you, Connor. Yeah, thanks, Connor. That was really well said. Um, another thing of, or like interesting aspect about podcasts in archaeology, which before like a few years ago, I don't think there were too many other than like you know, Radio Lab and like things like that, Science Friday, um, that you kind of hear archaeology on. But in terms of like, I'll put it to you guys this way, some of the most like genuinely like intriguing conversations I've had in my life have come from after a day of field work while you have like a beer or two in you and you're talking about the Mesolithic age of France and you're like what were they thinking like what would they do that and like you have these cool talks about it where you're at like a paleo Indian camp and you're asking each other after work like oh, why did they kill this mammoth like what were they like what was it like and just the, one the hilarity of the conversations at the end of the day <laughs> And then two, just like the ridiculousness of it sometimes. And then at the same time, while you're all very educated people having a conversation, it's interesting. And I wish you could bottle that up some way because it, 
when I see my parents who are nurses come home and talk about their day, it's like an everyday thing for me. It's like, oh, someone coded or like <laughs> uh, I dropped the needle on the floor today kind of thing like that. But like none of my friends or family get to see what we do in the field unless they're there. And if they're there, they have no idea what we're talking about. But then if you can bottle that up and put it into a podcast, uh, people can hear the conversations that archaeologists have and anthropologists. And obviously we're it's one of the most interdisciplinary sciences. So it's just always an interesting conversation. And then you bring another guest on who has a more insightful view of something or something you didn't think about before. Um, it's awesome. So I, I, I think podcasts are very Wonderful, thank you so much for that, David. Does anybody else want to add something um, in terms of podcasts? If no, oh, go for it, Carlton. Yeah, I think just to piggyback off of what uh, David and, and Connor both said, you know, really tying in how academia prepares you for podcasting, it's panels like this, it's giving presentations. So like, even though our podcast is an hour long or most podcasts are an hour long, we have three 15 to 18 minute segments, which are the exact length of most college presentations. So we're able to take that format already provided through us for higher academic, through higher academia, as well as, you know, undergraduate and confine that, you know, so that's where that comes into play. Whereas as well, I think we'll get to later how, you know, Instagram posts or word limits less than a thousand become more of a problem for academics, but that will come later. So um, yes. Thank you all so much for your perspective on podcasts. I had never thought about them like this and I'm really just seeing them in a completely new light now. Um, our next question, we're gonna move uh, slightly um, from podcasts. Our next question is for Natasha. So on your various platforms, Natasha, you talk very openly about the pros and cons of archeology. span In a previous interview uh, for one of our career videos, actually, um, you, you mentioned that you're very careful not to glamorize archeology, span especially CRM. Why do you take this position and what role does social media play in shaping popular perceptions of the field? It's a great question. So I don't want to be sounding negative about archaeology, but at the end of the day, there are two sides to, to a coin. There are, there are good days, there are bad days. And whatever we see on social media, in general, maybe even from our lecturers, or when we speak to each other about field schools at university, it's always the positive, right? It's what we remember, those positive experiences. But when you're working in archaeology, you're doing it every day, um, it's very different. We have good days and bad days. Generally, it's the working with a team that makes it like memorable and enjoyable. But there are things that I wish I knew before I started a career in archaeology. And I feel that there's a really big gap. Unfortunately, even when I speak maybe to my to my friends or to my family who are not in the, the sphere of archaeology, they see it as, wow, that's so cool. I want to be an archaeologist when I was younger. That's always the reaction I get. And, I, and they ask me, what's your favorite site? But they don't realize um, just how much that goes into discovering something, recording something. They don't understand how physical it is, especially in the UK and in the US and in Canada. We are the archaeologists who are, who are also the laborers, if you like. Um, I've been on other sites that actually have hired uh, laborers coming in to excavate, and then you have the archaeologist as the supervisor watching them. I've had people comment on my YouTube channel telling me I'm not an archaeologist, I'm just a digger. Yeah, I am just have a degree, I'm just digging a hole. They don't understand that, oh, actually in the UK, uh, nobody is allowed to touch the archaeology except the archaeologists. Nobody is allowed to touch that human burial except a professional archaeologist who's been trained to do that. We have so many processes and that's the importance of speaking about it to the public, speaking about it with students who, who are thinking, what can I do after they graduate? So there, there is, it's difficult to get a job in archaeology. It really is. And maybe on my part, I, sh I should actually be doing more. I should be making some videos and um, doing more Q&As to help people get jobs. I try, I answer messages all the time. My inbox is filled with them all the time and I only have so much time to, to answer them all because you know, I am working in it as well. So I, I really feel it's important for us to not ideologize um, the industry. It is amazing. Field schools are so fun, but that's just two weeks to, to five weeks in a year. That's not reality. Um, and I'm sorry to, to, to say that archaeology, there's so much more to it. Um, there are deadlines. 
there are situations where we are subcontracted on. We're not just dealing with our other archaeologists and the archaeology company. We're dealing with people who don't want us there. We're dealing with people who are literally like time is money. You're wasting our money. We have to fight for doing our research. We have to fight to preserve. We have to fight to rescue the archaeology. There is so much more. And, and the more experience you get, the more responsibility you have. So my job is not only dealing with the archaeology, it can also be dealing with people who are shouting at the staff or putting pressure on the staff to get the job done by a deadline. They don't care what we find. So us as professionals are trying to do that as much as we can, give the integrity to the archaeological deposits that we can. But we also have to understand, you know, like even something like the artifacts. Um, this is why I love the public engagement side because it brings me back into why I do my job because you have, you lose yourself sometimes. If you're not careful, you will lose yourself because there comes a point where you're like, okay, I have a day, I've got to get this area done. And you, you don't enjoy doing your job, which is, is what you think of as a field school. You enjoy every element. You love finding that little bit of pottery or when the archeological deposit changes, you get a bit of different strat. You love that. But when you're doing it all day, every day, I'm seeing multi-phase sites, I'm, I'm doing it all. Um, maybe on my half, behalf, um, I, I lose the love or the appreciation, not the love, the appreciation, I lose the appreciation of what I'm doing. And, and this is why maybe for me as well, that I do public engagement to, to keep myself honed in, to understand that um, this is really cool what I'm doing and also to share it and, and to show students that you're gonna have good days and bad days, um, which is why I, call, I kind of go towards more mental health now, sometimes, not all the time. Um, but whenever you have sort of ask an archaeologist days, I'm always very vocal about you're going to have good days and bad days and it's okay. It's normal. You know, there are support networks out there. Uh, you should be communicating with each other. So I could go on about this for ages, so I do apologize for rambling. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a really, it's really important to show that um, you can have a career in archaeology. And there are so many different departments, which is um, why I get involved with TV archaeology, TV archaeology. It's actually archaeology, but it's just filmed, uh, which is the Great British Dig. That's filmed community excavations, but you're seeing so many different um, job careers you can go down. There's so many different routes to stay within archaeology. You can specialize in finds. You can do GIS like Connor. You can do so much. Um, and that's why I love doing TV stuff and the more YouTube videos or Instagram videos. Q and A's. I love doing that to show you that there's this, there's so many careers. It's not just digging. There's more to archaeology than digging, even though that's what I do. There's definitely more to it, and it's open for everyone to do, no matter what your strengths are. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Natasha. And please don't apologize for telling us uh, your perspective. It is very much appreciated. Um, does anybody else want to add on in terms of what our role can be with social media in terms of accurately portraying the good things and the bad things of our discipline? Go for it, Connor. Uh, I just wanted to add on to that. Um, like Natasha says that um, CRM is private business and that's that's the reality of the situation or cultural resource management. What, what her and I do in different formats um, is a business ultimately that we have to obey these deadlines and, and things like that. Um, I, I also say this coming from a cushy office job where I sit in climate controlled area and have you know lumbar supported chairs and everything like that. But there are, are really hard days in, in CRM where you, it's raining, it's miserable and you have to do, you have to push through it because that's, that's your job. So I, I really enjoy um, and I think I, I need to step out and do more of this is, is, is to show that side because it's not, it's not all glamorous, especially in the, in the private industry. Um, and, and the folks need to be aware of it. There's a, there's a physical aspect, aspect to archeology span that um, may not be talked about and it, and it limits folks who can, who can do certain things. And, but that also, um, then they have different jobs and things like that. So there is, there's just a lot to it that we need to, um, as a community, get good at explaining, I think. And there's also the romanticization of archaeology as well, which I thought you all did such a wonderful job talking about in the last podcast um, when you talked about the, the dig. Um, and this is like a question that popped into my mind. Um, but if anybody wants to um, talk a little bit about the romanticization, the romanticization of archaeology and what our role may be in sort of 
checking that. And if not, we can also come back to it later. Go for it, Carlton. Um, no, no, David. David needs to talk first because he he had something to say before before I did. Um, I was just gonna say, like, and this might be a little pessimistic of me, but like, uh, on the terms of romanticization, like, if people message me and say, like, how do I do what you do? I want to be an archaeologist my whole life. I will like be the first person to tell them, like, do you though? Like, it, it's hard. There's some days where it's like not what it's gonna be cracked up to be. I was digging out in the desert uh, with a CRM company. And like on my sixth negative shovel test of the day and I was dehydrated and then it just dumped snow on me within 30 seconds of that. Uh, like the sky just like went dark and dumped. I was like, what am I doing with my life? Um, and that's when I like was like, I'm gonna apply to schools, I'm gonna do something else. And then um, there's times where it's like, you might wanna be an accountant. Like <laughs> there's something else you might wanna do, consider that. But if you do really love it, here's what you need to know. And I'll, like, I'll go and tell them like, Here's the reality of it. Also, we're in a pandemic, so like you might want to hold off for a bit. I don't know. It just depends. But then you get into like, am I gatekeeping, and it becomes like a whole um, that's a thing. But anyway, for the, the romanticization of it, it's like the t TV makes it look way more glamorous than it is, and also books and obviously Indiana Jones and stuff. So at the same time, that's what got me into it. So I can't deny somebody else's like as a kid, I, I loved watching that stuff. So. I don't know, and I'm an archaeologist now, so I, it's hard to it's hard to balance. And I think anyone in academia probably feels the same way. Did you want to go, Raven, and then Carlton? Oh, yes. Oh, oh, Carlton, go because Carlton wanted to go first. Okay. Yeah, I mean, every, about like every other day, I question why I didn't go into marketing, right? Uh, kind of as David talks about. You know, what we do, uh, all of us, including some of our other colleagues like Stefan Milo and other, you know, psychomers in archaeology, you, most people only see a glimpse of what we're doing. They're not seeing like the year long process of David editing a video or the backstory of us um, working on podcast outlines or even like what we show on social media, like the cool stuff we find that, um, there is this hidden side that not all of us talk about. And it's not just coming back to bad days with weather, but including mental health days in graduate school or undergraduate um, that come with many other professions. And, you know, those spaces have been, you know, relegated usually as taboo, right? Like you can't, if you're a, a something, I'm sure that you can attest to this arena when you're in uh, showing new graduate students around University of Michigan and your faculty says, you know, show them a good time, say nothing but but good things. You're not going to be very inclined to tell them like, hey, don't come here. This place sucks. And not saying it out about Michigan, but if you are in a climate, a negative climate, you, you don't feel you have space to, to voice these things, right? And CRM is its whole different beast in terms of, you know, even just where you work and what company you work for and what you can do about it. Um, and along with, I mean, first off, the romanization of archaeology most often gets misspoken for paleontology, as I'm sure many of us can, can affirm. Um, but it really comes down to more individuals on an individual basis trying to combat that narrative that most people think of archaeology. I mean, hell, we've got uh, emails from, from people who've listened who don't like our content because it doesn't fit with their narrative of what archaeology should be. I mean, we've been equivalent to a, a sleepover of 14 year old boys and that it's degrading to archaeology because we're so goofy and aloof about it. So it's like, there's not much we can do about that other than like, well, we're not changing, sorry. And, you know, archaeology does have a fun component. We're not just, uh, you know, um, I guess, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson's at all. We don't claim to be. We're more of the three stooges of archaeology. Thank you, Carlton. Raven, did you want to add something as well? Uh, most of it has already been said, but I do want to just kind of point out that yeah, we it, with the whole romanticize, romanticization of, of archaeology, you know, that is half the reason I think that everyone gets into archaeology because you have this idea of what it is and it is so, so different. And I will admit that I do, I'm guilty of romanticizing it quite a bit, usually on social media and YouTube because mostly because I get so excited by it. And I'm a, 
I have my own little romanticizing, you know, in my head, I'm always romantic with it, but it is so important to make sure that we are checking what we're putting out there as well, because if we want to show the real archaeology while still making it exciting, we have to make sure that there's that healthy balance. And so I think, especially what Natasha's doing with CRM and showing the rough side, because no one ever imagines archaeologists wearing complete head to toe, bright orange high vis, caked in mud, wearing a hard hat. Like you don't expect that when you're doing, when you think about becoming an archaeologist. So I feel like we need to have a very healthy mix of sort of romanticizing it, but also keeping it real. So we kind of just have to, you know, keep your feet on the ground, but your head in the clouds type thing in order to make sure that it's engaging enough because we don't want to be so negative and, you know, sort of like, yeah, this is really hard all the time, but you do have to be honest at the same time. So we have to, it, it, it's, it's one of those things that can, especially with social media, when you're getting the highlights reel of everyone's life. And you want to make sure that you have to be as, as transparent as possible, especially if you have a platform where people are looking towards getting information, trying to pursue the career, especially if, if kids that are in high school, I'm getting emails from kids, grade 11, grade 12, asking me, oh, that they want to be an archaeologist. And I, I kind of have to say like, well, you know, this it's very exciting, but here I am 10 years later and I'm still in school because I don't have a job. <laughs> So we need to, you know, it's very exciting, but we need to make sure we keep that that balance in check. Can I, mm. Sorry, there's one thing I probably should, oh, sorry, Con, I didn't see you. Sorry, I was just, I was just going to say that, um, you know, following on from Raven, we need to um, be fully aware that there's no job stability. Um, there's a lack of pay in the industry. Our working conditions are not good at all. Um, we work in all environments, all weather conditions. If it rains, we still got to get the job done. If it snows, we still got to get it done. In a heat wave, I've worn full PPE, but I still got to get my job done. I've been in asbestos gear. I'm on contaminated sites, for anyone who's not sure about that. You're in full um, respiratory equipment, like literally proper masks, everything head to toe. Uh, like, you know, from CSI, like I'm working in that, digging in that. The point is we're putting in very unusual circumstances. So it's very important that we try to show this. But of course there's positives, believe it or not, if you're not sure about a master's and you wanna work in the UK anyway, you can. You don't actually need a degree to work in archeology span in the UK. Just wanna say that right now, you don't need a degree to do it. And it doesn't actually matter how many degrees you have. If you'd like to do CRM or commercial archeology span in the field industry anyway, you don't need anything because no matter how many you have, you'll still start at the bottom and you have to work your way up. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's true. And it's something I only learned once I was in the industry myself. So it's the unfortunate side to it, but still it's amazing. You meet amazing people um, and do what you want to do. But I'm just a message away anyway, if you need some help. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I wanted to add to it. Um, it's hard as, uh, I mean, it's more difficult for folks who do video stuff and, and things like that. You want, you want to attract people to archaeology, right? You want them to get excited about it. And it's, it's hard to find that balance where you only show the, you know, I, I use this like very generally, like the really sexy archaeology, the really cool stuff that you find because you want people to be excited and you want to grow your, uh, your podcast, your, your YouTube channel, your Instagram so it's this weird, weird balance where we have to, you know, be real about what we see, but we also need to inspire the next generation. That's, that's the goal, I think, of all of us here is to make people get people excited about archaeology and keep this discipline going. So I just think it's super difficult balance between being real, but also growing and expanding and reaching more people. And then also there's a, there's a power behind using social media to show the real archaeology. Um, I had a colleague uh, a couple of years ago because they're still going through the World Trade Center rubble. Um, there's archaeologists involved with that. And the city of New York cut their funding. So instead of wearing PPE, they were wearing trash bags as protection. And so they used social media to take a photo of it. And that went viral in New York City and people were very upset to see the archeologists involved in going through World Trade Center rubble were wearing trash bags. And within two days, they had full PPE that they were supposed to. So there's a power in using social media to show, you know, at least to change policy when it comes to showing the true face of archeology. span 
Wonderful. Thank you all so much um, for all of your perspectives on this. And I think it is really important that you all touched on this, this thing of balance. It's showing the truth, but still uh, intrigue, uh, allowing to people to see the, the positives and the intriguing sides of archaeology as well. Um, so our next question is for David. Um, so part of social media and outreach is actually engaging with people on posts, and this can be very rewarding but it can also be a minefield to navigate. And I've seen some of the comments that you get on your posts and um, some are just wild, they're in the out there. And there seems to be no rules of engagement when it comes to comments, especially for content creators in academia. So uh, I was wondering if you could kind of elaborate for us on how you suggest we approach these sorts of interactions. Wild uh, would be understating it sometimes. Um, yeah. Um, so, in the beginning of it, it was really easy to see every um, comment and address them. And it's usually people being like, wow, that's fascinating. And like, you can just say like, right. And then <laughs> as it grows, you get more that you can't please. Uh, or like, you know, if I work a full-time job, I can't just sit there on Instagram all day and do it. Uh, my employees are listening, but the, um, I can also notice that other people will go in and comment on them for you like you get like your own following that then like will jump to defend you before somebody you get the chance to read it and that can cause a whole storm um but the, the for the minority of it it's always very positive people are genuinely intrigued by information or like excited to learn or share it or ask genuine questions but um and that's great and especially when they say like i didn't know that i'm going to send this to somebody that that's cool um but then you get the inevitable, like you and I wrote the uh, out of Africa versus multi-regional hypothesis post. You're gonna get some duds in there. Um, <laughs> and when those come up, usually you can either just ignore them um, or if it's somebody trying to, it's hard because it's the semiotics of it, right? Like, or the discourse, someone's trying to either provoke you or someone's just trying to say something that's like ignorant. Uh, and if it's an ignorant statement or a naive statement, I should say, I will go in and, and answer the question and be like, okay, actually what you're trying to say is this, but I would say it this way. Um, and if it's something that's just completely, I'm not gonna dignify it. I've just said like, I'm not gonna dignify this, like and something like that, but it depends. Um, the, the funniest thing to me is I will use similar sources for different posts. And when it's one post, uh, talking about, you know, dogs and foraging. I'll use the same chapter of a book for that citation, but then I say one thing about feminism or race using that same book chapter. Somebody says, you have an agenda, I'm unfollowing you, blah, 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 blah. It's like, I, you didn't have a problem yesterday from the same author, so I don't know what your deal is, but uh, it just, it depends. You're going to get them. The more following you get, the more they're going to be there. But the number one thing I would suggest is meet them on their level. Don't immediately assume that they mean the worst. Uh, try to educate them. I try my best not to block people. I think I've prided myself on only having to block like 10 people or so, because if you block them, let's go on a tangent here. Sorry, but if you block them, they're not going to learn any more of what you want them to learn. And they're going to be set in those ways. So I try to keep them or at least I'll take it to a DM conversation and say like, okay, what are you trying to say? Cause I want to give them the benefit of the doubt and I'll listen. But then some people are just going to raise bait and it, it's going to be an issue. Um, but for the most part, yeah, try to don't come at them from an ivory tower archeology span position. Like they think you are like all the media tells them that archeologists are these rich snooty people that have tons of money. I'm laughing in medical debt right here. Like it's not, <laughs> we don't. Uh, so yeah, just meet them as a person. Uh, I think that's probably my best answer if that answers the question. It does, thank you so much. And I also want to open up the floor um, to anybody else that may want to add or comment. But I, I really appreciated um, how you stressed the importance of discourse and not blocking somebody right away because part of why we put information out there is so that people can absorb it. And sometimes people may be coming from a perspective that is a little misled and that shouldn't be like the cutoff point right away. I mean, there does, there's a line, um, but I really appreciate the fact that you stressed the importance of conversation. Does anybody else have something to add? Go for it. One more Sorry, thing. Um, I just want to add, 
Oh, good. No, no, go, go David. Oh, um, with the, the meeting I'm on there, like, I forget what point I was saying there, but there's another option of that it's from a different language and they're translating it into English and that's what you're reading or they've translated what they're trying to say from another language into that, which could make it come across as more blunt. It could make it come across as more vicious or like rude in a way, you know? Um, and that's our English speaking world interpreting that. So like sometimes it's easy to use, like you gotta think about it with your linguistic cap on, thinking like, okay, this person probably meant this. And I like, sometimes I'll like, my nostrils were flare at a comment and I'm like, no, they didn't mean that. They just are saying this. So anyway, go. I was just going to say that, um, you know, what we do and what other uh, science communication or communicators do is we're, we're trying to change the narrative. We have the power right now. And at the moment, pseudoscience is, is really the, the main what everyone sees is, is what you know Graham Hancock shows because it's tantalizing it grips the audience but that's why it's more important to build a community like this um, because we need to change the narrative and we've got to do it quick because the, the longer we leave it the less archaeologists and historians who are out there doing social media the more power we give to individuals who are there to spread hate and are there to to really not give what we do and what we're passionate about the true platform and the true information. They're all about disinformation. And that's why we've got to stick together and we've got to grow and we've got to really tackle it. And that's now social media is the way to do that. Create content, guys. If you're watching it and you want to create a video, you want to do a blog, you got to do it. We're all here. I'm sure you can reach out to any of us who you think might be able to relate to you and your information. Just get, you know, get in contact. I'm sure we'll be able to find time between us anyway to answer your queries. That's what I want to say. Thank you so much for that, Tash. And that actually ties into our next question, which deals specifically with misinformation. So I would love to hear everybody's perspective on this. Um, so this question is directed for Seth Carlton. Um, so whenever you put something on the internet, for example, there's always a little bit of negativity and, and a pattern we've noticed with archeology span accounts in particular is just the sheer amount of misinformation and conspiracy theories that kind of follow when a post is made. Um, so I guess you can kind of think of this as the downside of social media, the misinformation, that misinformation can be spread just as easily as factual information. Um, so what are your thoughts on how we can address misinformation on social media? Uh, for example, when someone comments that aliens built the pyramids on your latest post or something like that. So this is a very loaded question. Um, and in particular, you know, when you say, <sighs> how can we address and like, what does that we mean? Is that archeology span as the discipline, us as young professionals in the field? First off, one of the things that I've been in, in our podcast has been railing for is more support from the academy for science communication in general. Um, this is still seen as, oh, you do that in your free time. You know, you go play on social media, um, you know, but still write the papers you need to write. And this is why science in general is losing the science wars. You know, we still have, I think, the recent denial of vaccines, why COVID is so bad. The United States has just passed 500,000 deaths due to COVID-19. Um, and so there has to be a top level approach. I believe the SAA is now allows you to put social media on your CV. But in terms of what we can do as young professionals, right? Like our, our age group, but you know, the people that you're talking here today, um, what can we do? And it's, it's collaboration with one another, which this group's pretty good at. David is really good with it, that he always is working with other archeologists and relying on their expertise to build stronger narratives. And David already kind of answered this question. Like, how do you engage with these people in misinformation? Um, you know, one is, you can't get upset right off the bat. It could be translation issues. For us, that these are our held dear beliefs that are foundational to our understanding of the world around us, but to other people, not so. So you have to divest yourself from that personal aspect of the research and of the information. And it's really trying to develop a relationship with them. Why do they think this? And it's usually a personal reason. And this extends just beyond archaeology. Like, why do some people think the world is flat? That's fascinating. And it's trying to make a human connection with them and maybe to create that dialogue. Now, sometimes you just won't get that way. I don't know what it is, but every time the three of us talk about how Hitler's Aryan race thing is wrong, those are always the times we get comments 
from white nationalists. And we, at first we try to engage like, no, this is wrong, but it gets really rough very quickly. And at that point, you just have to cut them out. You know, it's how do you want to spend your time? I think uh, we had a, a guest on Talia Farnsworth from Denver Museum of Nature and Science, who's a science communicator in her episode, she really hit the nail on the head because she has to talk with the public all the time, including children. Um, and having to explain that uh, nocturnal emissions do not mean night vision to young children. Um, and so it runs a gambit and how this relates to how do we talk about this on social media? It's picking your battles. You know, what's more important? You have so many characters to get your point across. If you want to talk about human behavior ecology, that's a lot of baggage behind that. Even evolution. You know, some if people say, well, why well, don't didn't come from monkeys? Well, then you have to be like, well, we're not monkeys, we're apes, you know, common ancestor. This is how we know. And you should get yourself in the weeds really quick. So we need more training in general, like the whole discipline archaeology needs to be supported in social media. We need to be taught how to work it. You know, if the grad students are on here, you guys are writing 20 to 25 page papers on a theory topic or something else. You're not, we're not equipped to write blogs, to write social media posts. And it's all self-taught and it's all, you know, people like who was here on this presentation, helping each other and collaborating with one another. So for now, it's relying on other people reaching out to other archeologists that you follow and ask to collaborate or how they can help. Um, that's how we develop this. You know, me, Connor, David, and <laughs> Natasha and Raven weren't just friends on the outset who decided to work together. We saw their content, we liked it, and we talked with them. And that goes, you know, especially for Amelia Dahl, um, Archaeology Gains, whose name unfortunately escapes me at the moment, um, but Stefan Milo and others, you know, it's just, that's how we've built this community, is just talking to one another and helping each other out, trying to be the voice in archaeology from Europe to the United States and Canada, and trying to dispel some of these myth misinformation by posting our own topics, at least having it readily available, taking those articles that we all pay student fees for and synthesizing American antiquity down to 500 words and saying here public this is yours you paid for it with your taxes but we're making it available to you in a digestible manner that's amazing thanks so much Carlton um does anybody else want to add on to that good for you um so Connor pointed out earlier that I've dabbled with TikTok now and I resisted it forever. Um, but I genuinely, it's fun. I like TikTok. If you guys are like, nah, I don't like TikTok, try it. It's fun. Uh, but I'm not doing like dances and stuff like that. The, the big thing on TikTok is it's 60 seconds is the longest you can do. Uh, I think Instagram reels are now only 30 seconds. Uh, but in 60 seconds, somebody on TikTok can say, this is an example I saw the other day, was like, here's things you didn't know about the past, go back to Tepe edition or go, go back to Tepe. And they'll grant a whole bunch of facts about like mathematical equations and the universe points this way and there's a square there. So therefore it has to be built by Neanderthals and like just something. And at the end, it's like, everything we know about the past is wrong. And that's a soundbite that then goes viral because people feel like, oh, I learned something new and everyone else is dumb now. And they'll send that. And that video has like 6 million views on it. And I have a smaller TikTok. I can't make a viral video like that, just talking about the dryness of Gold Pecky Tepe, knowing like, yeah, it was a hundred galleries, like whatever. Uh, it doesn't do the same. So it's hard to combat it. I, there's a lot of people on there. I know that like you'll stitch videos. So like you, you'll play a little bit of another video and then you talk over it. Like you jump in and talk and they'll like bash that person or say like they're wrong for X, Y, and Z reason, but it doesn't go as far. And it's also, combative in a way and I try not to do that um I think I might have done it once or twice if I'm being honest but try not to and the hardest thing is you have to find a way to make or we all do everyone listening um find a way to make archaeology or anthropology fun entertaining and to make factual information like that go viral and I know you're trying to write grants and I know you're trying to like do a whole bunch of stuff, deal with your mental health. Like I'm doing it every day too, falling apart. But you got to figure something out because that's the only way the information is going to get out there. And we can't just keep sitting here writing in journals that 
45 people are going to read the article in your circle, whereas like someone's talking about Golbeckli Tepe being built by crustaceans because viral on TikTok by 6 million views. Like, I know it sounds futile in a way, but at least one factual viral video is better than no factual viral videos. So if you're teaching a class, maybe, and I tell this to people who ask me for advice all the time, when you write your term papers, write it as a script for a YouTube video. When you are thinking about anthropological lenses um, and how to like, you know, like, do I want an HPE lens or a processual lens? Think about your lens, like through an actual camera lens. Like, how do I tell this story and make it interesting and factual and make it appealing for the algorithms? Like, I don't know, I'm kind of going on a soapbox, but it, it, that's the only way to do it and try not to be like combative, just beat them at their game. Josh, do you want to go first and then Raven? Yeah, just going on from what David said, 100% please like write a script for what, even like a journal, because at the end of the day, I've been working for eight years in archeology, span working, okay? And even when I read an academic journal, I have to Google some of the words. To put that into perspective, I'm literally working in archeology span and I don't even understand sometimes what I'm reading. So can you imagine someone who's in the public, who's interested in history, interested in archeology, span reads these random books online, these random TikToks they're watching, all this random stuff, and they wanna find information, the real facts, how hard it can be for them to disseminate that knowledge. So that's what we need to think. If you're gonna write an article, why not write a quick one minute TikTok to just like introduce that article and they can click on it, right? So there's little things to think about and it's great what David just said. I think we should just take what David said, like cut that into a video and just like make that go. <laughs> right. Yes, so I have two quick points uh, from what David said. First of all, um, it's a great, you know, making sure that we are, and what Tash said as well, where, you know, we're, we're reading academic journals and sometimes even the academics don't have any idea what's going on in said journal. There's a problem right there. Um, so making things, things a little bit more accessible because without that, we get people like flat earthers and things where people, they wanna know the science, they wanna look into things, they wanna research stuff, but the only research that they have that's, accessible to them that's kind of portrayed in a way that they can understand that they want to absorb information that can be an issue so that's why because we're gatekeeping because we're using big fancy words and all this jargon we're not allowing people to properly access that information to learn and then they have to look for other sources the second thing I want to say is talking about storytelling I know with especially with science and academia, we really push against storytelling with because we don't want to try and make the, you know, kind of you know, all the conjecture, especially with archaeology and things that are missing in interpretation and, you know, what things can change the minute you pick, you dig something new up. But without that storytelling, without sort of being able to think about a narrative towards how you're going to portray your information, a lot of it just won't make it out to people that want to know the information because you're not going to get their attention. So I think that's another big thing is we need to really start looking at when we're studying something, when we're researching or writing anything, we have to look at how you want to tell the story. So even just even just reading and like going to storytelling, I guess you can't really go anywhere anyways, listening to storytelling podcasts and seeing how people craft even something that just happened in their life, you know, their trip to the grocery store. And I say like, how would I make that interesting? How would I tell that story? And sort of honing that and bringing it into the science world is something that we really need to, to improve upon and really put more effort into. Um, I just wanna add um, to this, we have to be aware of the next generation and how they consume stuff how they consume media and things like that so i'm my wife has uh younger siblings and the way they communicate is through TikToks and you know these kind of viral videos and things like that and if we want archaeology to continue as a discipline and flourish as a discipline we have to understand um how and when the future generation uh, consumes media and and how to present it to them to, um, to make it palatable, interesting, and 
ultimately to keep this discipline alive. So like these, like these folks said, we, we, we have to take that step um, to, to make sure we're, we're, we're keeping this discipline alive. Yeah. You know, and as, as Connor pointed and others, uh, maybe if you guys have Twitter, you follow DSA archeology span uh, by David Anderson, who was a professor of mine from undergraduate, and he's becoming known for writing for Forbes and combating pseudo archeology. span He still considers himself a Yucatan Maya archeologist, you know, but he's come becoming known for the science communication because no one else is doing it. Um, so it, it's kind of interesting how people get drawn into it. Like before, ruins life and ruins i i personally wasn't engaging in social media at all um it wasn't until uh we started doing instagram at david's lead did i become aware of the issue so if you're not on those platforms you don't even know what's going on and uh once again i wasn't really big on tiktok until david started sharing his tiktoks <clears throat> and seeing what is being said on that and it's the and as, as we mentioned before, right, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, they have word limits, not necessarily Facebook. So you have so many characters to write something science, science factual. And even with TikTok, Instagram video, you're taking minute, 30 second slices. Those environments are not conducive for science communication, not in a meaningful way, because you can have uh, the ancient aliens peoples of the world who say these stones are way too precisely cut must have been aliens to people who aren't aware of who you know did who fell asleep during history and high school chemistry and whatever that sounds like a sound argument but the real side which is also not as fun you know science fact archaeological facts are not anywhere near as interesting as well it looks like the neanderthals built Chattahoyuk because they figured out Pythagoras' theorem first because their brains were closer together. Like that's not as fun. So not only are we having to take longer time to explain these facts, but they're just fundamentally boring. Archaeology itself is as much as, as Connor said, we can make it look sexy because we show people the fun side, but uh, I've done CRM too. And I can't count like a month shoving you know digging test pits in southeastern virginia in july in over 100 degree weather i found one projectile point that's not very fun to talk about right so it's it's right now the systems that are being employed against us um they're just not conducive and it's going to take people to figure it out and it's mostly going to be teams of people to figure it out some people do it better david has a naturally better public engaging voice and persona than i do i don't have a caveman outfit and like as you can see my wall doesn't have paleolithic art i have hats a tv and a globe you know it's not even as visually appealing so it, it's going to take a lot of people to figure this out and why we you know we've just been reactive that's the big point. All of us have been reactive to the public and we just got to figure out a way to be proactive. Thank you all so much. So it seems like the key to the future will be collaboration, training and balance between truth telling and a little bit of pizzazz here and there. Um, so we're going to switch on to the second part of our Q&A now. Um, I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen. I'm so sorry. I should have done that earlier. And we're going to open up uh, questions from um, the audience. So if you just give me a second to get set up, give you all a moment to breathe, uh, maybe have a drink of water, and we're just going to transition to the next part. So we have uh, already quite a few questions in the chat. So I'm going to read them out and um, please feel free just to take on any question uh, that interests you um, in any order that works. So our first question uh, is actually a comment and a question. It's from Emma Lefebvre and she says, thank you all for being here today. This is really great to hear perspectives from, from so many years. I was wondering, how are you approaching awareness of indigenous rights in archeology span on social media? or in the field with contractors, um, if anybody wants to take on this question. I'm happy to answer. Carlton, do you wanna go first? Yeah, I'm, I'm belligerent. 
as an indigenous person who knows these things and like Connor and David both know, cause they've heard my rants several times about how indigenous people are, are involved. Um, it's difficult because uh, I do indigenous archeology. span You know, that's my theoretical framework and paradigm for working with the archeological record. And within indigenous archeology, span you're talking about over 572 federally recognized tribal nations on top of all the state recognized tribes who all do things very differently and have different belief systems. So not only do I do indigenous archeology, span I specifically do like Pawnee and Pawnee archeology span because that's the framework I work in. And trying to get people to understand that is, is difficult because part of it is how people are raised in the United States, not raised, but how they're educated about indigenous people. So there's a lot of layers you have to get through. And sometimes like I have been told multiple times, um, you're too white to be indigenous. I'm like I get that. And this is what happens when I have, you know, Scandinavian ancestry from three grandparents. Like I get that. You don't have to tell me I don't look indigenous. I've been told all my life. Um, so there's, there's, why I bring that up is that there's race dynamics behind that. Blood quantum becomes a huge issue. And there's other archeologists that do the same thing. Emily Van Alst from IU. She's also white passing Lakota. Um, it just becomes a difficult topic. And it, it just it comes down to public outreach again, trying to get more people involved. And things have definitely changed since 1990 with the package in the United States, right? This is a, a United States context. Um, things have shifted. Um, there are still some people prior to who got educations before the 90s who might still have holdouts. I know there was a big case recently where another bioarchaeologist had a bunch of NAGPRA remains that she has kept hidden for 30 years because she didn't believe indigenous people had the rights to those bonds. You know, that still happens. Um, so going, I, I totally went off on a tangent. I totally apologize. Um, And it can get, it, it's, it's just such a loaded question, you know, even, even trying to collaborate with indigenous people like David's post on, on the Iroquois on longhouses, he reached out and didn't hear anything. You know, there's, it's right now, the field of indigenous archeology span and working with indigenous people, it is, it's not solidified yet. You have a lot of different authors and a lot of different researchers who are telling people to do completely different things. The, the, my advice on working with indigenous people or talking about it is, is just try to be an ally, do your best. Um, if you're working with a specific tribe, reach out to them. You know, it's not the responsibility to get back to you. They have their own jobs, but don't take it personally. Um, we're all anthrop, well, in the United States, we're all anthropologists, right? We study human culture. And so just be cognizant of that. Even if you're archeologists, try to do some cultural ant things. Thank you for that, Carlton. David, did you have something you wanted to add? Um, I'll keep it brief, but um, I try my best to like, it, it gets into like a whole thing, but I try my best to represent as many people as I can, but I have to like, you know, admit my own bias is like, I only really know Mesolithic, Paleolithic Europe and the Americas in a way. Like, I don't know that much about Stone Age Africa besides like hominins and things. I don't know that much about Stone Age South Asia or Southeast Asia or Aboriginal Australia. So my posts will definitely skew Western in a way. And I like, that's what's in my head that I know I can just like make a post on really quick or I'll consult with like you, Arena, on like some posts as well. But um, there, it's hard to, especially to like represent everybody to like just randomly come up with a thought about here's will be a really cool idea about Stone Age Nigeria. And like, I don't know that much about it. Um, so I need to go out of my way to, to learn that. And that's good, uh, I, I think, but then it's just tough to do. But with indigenous American um, posts as well, I'm not indigenous American and I don't claim to be by any means. So it's like, how much of it is too much of me to post and then appropriate these people's, you know, cultures and, and talk about them from a perspective that's non indigenous and I have to reach out with indigenous peoples to To make those posts and oftentimes I don't hear back from them um, or I just I'm not looking in the right places kind of things like that. So then it skews one direction anyway. 
and it's like I have the best intentions, but um, you know, it, it gets tough. But the, the main thing is like, especially when I don't even know if there is a main thing. It's just I try my best to do it, and I'll consult with people that I do know, um, and I, I think it's fun, and I get positive engagement. But the, the best part about it I've seen is people from Europe or Asia or especially Australia. When I do post about Indigenous Americans, will message me like thanking me because they had no idea. They don't learn that history at all. It's just not known. Um, they had no idea about like X, Y, or Z tribes that lives out here, you know? So it, that's cool. I am educating in a way, but it's not my history. So it's always a little bit of awkwardness when I do it, if that answers the question. Yes, and this was a very big loaded question. I apologize. <laughs> um, I think the key things here also, and just hearing what you both had to say is impact and intent are different things. So we should keep that in mind. And as archaeologists, we need to be just cognizant of the stories that we and the information that we do share and if it's our place to be sharing those information. So I think those are interesting things for us to keep on thinking about as we move forward in archaeological engagement with wider audiences. Um, I have another question from James Manane, and he asks, hi, panel, uh, what would you say to those who would like to keep their professional and social lives separate? Go for it, Connor, sorry. Yeah, no, um, so uh, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult, and it can even be more difficult when you're trying to add in the, the complexity of uh, a social media life. You know, so you have the social media life, you have the social life, you have this professional life. Um, and I found it really helpful to keep those generally in, in their boxes where they, where they exist. Um, so I have, I have a, a cohort from college that I see at SAA's meetings, things like that, who I keep in this kind of social archaeology box that I see and hang out with and interact with. And it doesn't mean that I don't bring them into other boxes of my life as well, um, but that's generally where they exist. Um, so my, and then I have my social media life, which is my podcast, um, these folks here who obviously are my friends as well and fit in um, kind of a social box as well. But I try to keep that um, pretty distinctly separate from um, my professional career at this point. Um, because uh, it, it becomes difficult when you are working for a company and um, may have different opinions than your company has. So I'm not a representative of Alpine. I don't speak for the company, and I and I try to be very clear about that. Um, to, and, it, and it's important because it's just you just need to keep those generally separate. And and I feel generally happier if I if I deal with that. I don't actively promote our podcast at my at my work or anything like that. Because I see that as my social media face box, things like that. So I try to really keep those generally separate. And and, all, and although things mix, um, yeah, keeping them separate has has been really good for my mental health and and, and my professional career um, so far. So uh, Connor did great with the professional side. I want to touch quickly on the personal side of it because it can become this all consuming thing. And especially when you want to broaden your outreach to social medias, you have to be very open. You have to kind of be a little bit vulnerable. You have to show a little bit more of yourself or some people are very fake and they show like a personality that they create on social and it does wear on you and you feel like you know you are just giving yourself away to all these people to all these strangers and I would just recommend having you uh, uh, you know what you're doing separate from your personal life so have for example I have social medias that are personal and private no one can access them unless I give them the, the energy, the space to do so, if I give them permission to see that, because I want to make sure that my private life is separate from my pers uh, my social media, my professional life. Currently, my social media, professional life are kind of very intermixed, so it is difficult for me to separate those two, so I'm kind of stuck. Just I got to go full fault of throttle on that, but personally, keep your set, your hold yourself separate. Keep a bit, a bit of you separate because of your mental health, because of your identity and 
I would also say keep your relationships off of social media for your personal, uh, for your social media one, because things happen. And uh, <laughs> from my personal experience, but really it's just about making sure that you are setting healthy boundaries for yourself and they will look different no matter who you are. So you just need to make sure you're checking in with yourself to make sure that you're not sharing more than you want to. You're not giving away more than you want to on these outreach platforms. And you're making sure that you're taking time away from them in order to make sure you remember who you are and just kind of keep some things to yourselves. Just to add, um, Connor probably will be able to probably add to this as well. Um, being in the CRM world, we're not actually allowed to, to talk about what we do too much because we have a lot of constraints by our companies. So there's only so much I can actually share about what I do at work. And sometimes some posts, the photos are taken a few months before or even a year before because I'm not allowed to share that due to the agreements that I sign. And sometimes bearing in mind, I'm actually running these sites and I have like 30 staff members that I'm you know, um, supervising. I have to be a role model in that sense. I, I can't have them seeing me post something and I'm telling them you're not allowed to post it. So we have to be very aware of this fact as well. Um, a lot of things you may see online, the reason why they're taken in a certain way is because we're actually not allowed to show you what we're doing right now. Um, so these are things to counter in, um, to have this balance with the professional and personal life. Also, as Raven says as well about, you know, you've got to make sure your mental health is in check. You've got to make sure that this, there's not too much of a crossover because otherwise you don't want to be too consumed. With, with being on your phones guys it's not good for you enjoy the fresh air <laughs> yeah enjoy it and um, if you're fortunate enough and you can bring social media within your relationship in a healthy way then great that's good um, to be honest I'm somebody who has social media that's a part of my relationship but I've been I'm, I'm a married uh, individual who's been in a relationship for you know six years and this is a part of our of what we're doing to, to grow um, me as an individual and bearing in mind I do tv so even if I don't really want to do social media, I have no choice. I kind of have to do social media. Um, so it's understanding that sometimes we, we have these struggles within and we do need a support network that might be with our peers that you see on the screen. These are somewhat my support network. Um, I love them all dearly. Uh, they may not know it, but I do. I appreciate you all. And we are collectively we're strong and, and that's what it matters. And that's why our community is so important. So it's okay if you, um, if you feel a bit uncomfortable, being, uh, comfortable, uncomfortable, sorry, about being on social media, it's okay. That's very normal. Um, but try, if you want to try to engage, it's okay. And you can create these networks like we have here. Um, you can create that yourself. So don't have that fear. Thank you all so much. And I do want to just make a brief note on time. I can't believe it. We're almost five minutes too. We've been here for an hour and a half. Time really does fly. Um, so I'm going to pose one last question um, to the group, and this is an anonymous question that came in, and they ask, what do you hope your audiences do with the information that you share with them? So what, what would be your takeaway for the, the things that you put out there for people? Uh... It's, that's a, it's a tough question to, to, to put into like a few words, but I would say um, it, I hope they learn something. And with mine, it's, I guess it's like a little unique in the sense that like I do it with dogs is like the, the front of the business, I would say. Um, and like, I want people like with the, the first illustration I got with um, Atori, like the artist that I hired like I put the dog burial painting there so I could show people like people in the Paleolithic had the same stuff that we deal with now, right? Like they were losing animals and or like had loved ones that go away. It, debatable if it's a loved dog at that point. But anyway, point is like, I want people to take away from our posts and our things that like, okay, people back then weren't so different than we are now. Um, and that cultures are different, which, like, which anthropology teaches, right? Like everyone is different, but we are in the same sense, all human in a way. Um, and anthropology is probably the most undersold 
science there is, but it's also the most fascinating at the same time. So like if people can just get introduced to it in a way that's digestible um, and then can take away be like, oh, that's fascinating. Or I didn't know that existed, which is the most common comment I get. It like makes me feel good, but then it also makes me know that like we're doing a good thing with what we're learning. And like what I learned from my professors is good. Um, if that answers it. Go for it, Connor. Uh, I'll add something else. Um, one of the funnest things that's happened as part of this um, podcast adventure that we're, we're on currently is that my, uh, my parents who know nothing about um, anthropology or not nothing, but they, um, didn't study it and they, um, you know, they just don't know a lot about anthropology or archeology. span Um, I get to have a conversation with them at least once a week where they be like, Oh, like, like David was saying, I, I didn't know that. That's, that's really cool. That's really interesting. Um, and I think that's what I want to inspire. I want to inspire people to take, um, the next step. Uh, the public in general to take the next step and do some more research on the topics we're talking about. Um, and another thing that we do, and especially specifically at a Life in Ruins, is try to inspire the next generation of archaeologists, the undergrads, the high school kids, things like that. We want them to be excited by it. We want to continue this discipline. So, you know, I want people to be excited. I want people to be interested. And then I want people to get into the field and, and, and really enjoy it. Would anyone else like to chime in? So most of what everything has usually been said, most of it, but I wanna really point out like for me, for people, what people are taking away, what I want them to take away from mine is that it's, it's not this like, inaccessible area, this inaccessible field. And people, you know, not to be like, I want people to be encouraged by it and inspired and excited and wanting to pursue it because there are so many roadblocks towards getting to where you wanna go in anything in life. And I just wanna make it a little bit easier for somebody to just be excited about it or to make that decision. And for me, the, the most, heartwarming things um, that I get are emails and direct messages from people saying like, you know, your video helped me pass my midterm or your videos have helped me decide that I want to study this. I wasn't sure. And then, you know, I've seen it and now I understand where to go or can we have a Zoom chat because I need to, I have so many questions that I can't find answers to and being able to be that person just for somebody that has you know, just any advice to like give them and put them in the right direction is really, for me, I, I find it really rewarding because I remember being in that position and not knowing where to go, not knowing who to turn to and not getting any answers or responses from anyone that I was messaging or emailing and ask even in person. So I really hope that people are empowered to reach out and ask these sort of questions and go after what they want to do. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time and for your perspective and for your expertise. Um, we are at 1.30 and I want to acknowledge that we still have quite a few questions in the chat that we didn't get to. Please don't be discouraged if we didn't get to your questions. This conversation today is merely a starting point. So please follow these wonderful people on their various platforms and continue to ask questions about social media and how we can use it critically um, in academia to engage with a wide audience. Um, before I close this off today, does anybody have any closing remarks that they would like to share? You can email us questions at our um, email if you if you want to ask them. Some of these questions are really good. I'd love to answer them, um, but I'll stop. Yeah, thank you for that, David. We'll see if we can share these uh, or save these so that we can try to answer them in the future as well. I just I just want to say thank you, Arena, for facilitating this and. University of Michigan for, um, yeah, for hosting stuff like this. Yeah, thank you guys so much being invited by University of Michigan, one of the big anthropology schools in the state to come and be an expert. CV builder, but more importantly, 
Um, my advice for anyone interested in this, just, just do it. Um, you're not going to get paid much in archaeology anyway. So if you have a great idea or you want to start an account, do it. YouTube channel, just see where you can go with it. You know, it's not a permanent gig. It doesn't have to be. Um, don't be discouraged. You know, this, this all started uh, with the podcast. It started as a whim because I was on a podcast and I roped Connor and David into it. And And now, and this, it's just provided these opportunities. And that wasn't the goal. It was just because the three of us were very passionate. And we, in our podcast is just talking to people that we want to learn from. So, and do you have an idea like that? Go for it. And um, if you're interested in doing any sort of more like TV presenting or anything like that, you can either hit me up or well, DM me, um, or you can actually check out pastpreservers.com. They represent um, archaeologists, historians and science folk. So you can always send them your demo and though you put on their books and maybe if they see potential, you might be able to be a presenter like me and, you know, get your own show. So th there's so many avenues and you can, you can message us anyway on Instagram. And we're all we're all there. So that's it. So thank you again, Arena. Really quick, I just want to say that if you, um, you know, just jumping off of what Carlton said for a last thing, don't be discouraged if someone's already doing something that you want to be doing because everyone says something and presents things and has their own story in a different way. So if you feel like you know you don't, you, if you're feeling any sort of hesitation towards starting something don't, don't just, just do it because no one's going to say the same thing in the same way that you're going to say it. And we need more voices out there to just kind of build the team. We're built, you know, we're the archaeology of vendors. We need more vendors. It's a whole universe, right? So we need to make sure that uh, we're trying to get every voice involved. And so just, you know, just start it. And we're all here for you guys. We're ready to just, you know, support everyone and just make this pretty, yeah, just build a whole community around it. Wonderful. Thank you again so, so much. And I do want to acknowledge the wonderful team of people that helped make this panel possible behind the scenes, the amazing students at Ka and at the Uma Brown Bag, our wonderful social media, Eliezan Jenny Larios, our co-chairs co of Ka, uh, Joey Frankel and Hannah Hoover, and every single person that's been here um, helping organize along the way. It takes a village and it's really been such a pleasure to have you all here. Um, and like I said, again, please everyone do feel free to follow these wonderful people um, and learn more about archeology. span And with that, I, I think we're done. Thank you again so much. Thanks, Irina. No problem, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye everyone.